The topic of today's discussion is who is Mashiach? Who is the Messiah? What are the qualities or traits that are needed for the Messiah? And what is he meant to accomplish? So the first thing that we have to remember is that Mashiach, the Messiah, is a job description. In the same way that if you were hiring someone for your law firm or for your doctor's office, you would want them to have certain qualities as a person, and also you'd want to know what were they planning to accomplish, that they're able to do what they plan to accomplish. So Mashiach is a job description in the same way. Firstly, what does Mashiach actually mean? There are certain qualities that qualify an individual to be Mashiach. Mashiach means anointed one. Mashiach refers to someone who was anointed with oil. It was a general term for someone who had a position of leadership. If you take a look at your source sheet on source number one, you'll see that the Torah commentators look, in the, look at a verse in Isaiah and they say that the word Mashiach refers to leadership and greatness. We see some examples of how the term is used in the Torah text as well. When speaking about the anointed priests, the verses say, and it says in Exodus, you shall take the anointing oil, pour it on the head, and anoint him. And if you take a look at text number two, the priest is called Kohen HaMashiach, which literally means the anointed Kohen. Take a look at text number two, you'll see that inside, where it says in Leviticus, if the anointed Kohen, i.e. the Kohen HaMashiach, sins, this is the, these are the laws. So the word Kohen, excuse me, the word Mashiach is a word that refers to anointedness and it's a general term for leadership. What are the traits necessary to be Mashiach? Not the Mashiach in the generic sense, but Mashiach, the Messiah, the, the one who ushers in the redemption. So contrary to the idea of the personal qualities of the Messiah in other faiths, Judaism writes that the Messiah is a person of flesh and blood, born of two human parents, and not any sort of quasi-deity. So, number one, he's a human. Secondly, Mashiach is a paternal descendant of King David through his son Solomon. Scripture clearly states that Mashiach will be a descendant of the house of David. If you take a look at text number, five, number four excuse me, on your text sheet, it says, a shoot shall spring forth from the stem of Jesse, David's father, and a twig shall sprout from his roots. Also text number five, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I set up from the house of David a righteous shoot, and he shall raise as king and prosper, and he will perform judgment and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah shall be saved, and Israel will dwell safely, and this, his name shall be called, the Lord is righteousness. Mashiach will be a descendant of King David because once David was anointed king by the prophet Shmuel, he acquired the kingship for himself and his descendants forever. The verse very clearly says in 2 Samuel, your throne shall be established forever, talking about David's dynasty being the eternal dynasty. In the Psalms, Hashem, God writes, if his children will forsake my Torah and cease walking in my statutes, I will punish their transgressions, but nevertheless, I will not utterly remove my grace from him. His throne is established forever. So David's kingship, David's line, is something that lasts forever. Also, the Bible text singles out King Solomon as the son who will inherit David's line. So not only will the Messiah come from King David, but it will be a descendant of King David through his son Solomon. Take a look in the book of Chronicles where it says, Behold, a son will be born to you. He will be a man of peace, and I shall give him peace. And all his enemies around him, for Shlomo is his name. Shlomo meaning peace. He shall build a house in my name, and he shall be to me a son, and I to him as a father, and I shall prepare the throne of his kingdom forever. So the Messiah is a descendant of King David, specifically through his son Solomon, nobody else. Mashiach, being a descendant of King David and Solomon, is quantified by the Rambam, by Maimonides, the famed medieval sage, as part of the 12th 
principle of faith. Another quality of the Mashiach himself is that he has to be an exceptionally righteous person and possess a very deep love of every person. So when narrowing the idea of who could be Mashiach in any given generation down, you have to take a look at all the people in the world. You find a descendant of King David and King David through Solomon, and then he has to be also a very righteous individual who cares for everybody. Another quality that Mashiach will have is he will be a profound Torah scholar, constantly immersed in Torah and its mitzvahs and strengthening its observance throughout the Jewish community. If you take a look at text number six in the, in the handout, it says, if a king will arise from the house of David who diligently contemplates the Torah and its commandments as prescribed by the written and the oral law, as David his ancestor, he will compel, compel all of Israel to walk in the way of the Torah and rectify the breaches in its observance and fight the wars of God, we may with assurance consider that person Mashiach. In text number seven, it says that the Messiah will be just as knowledgeable as King Solomon and second only to, to Moses in the level of prophecy. So again, Mashiach is a job description. He has to have certain qualities, certain traits. What that means also is that it's not necessarily just one figure that we are waiting for, but that every generation has its candidate that would qualify should the timing be right. In other words, if God said that, determined that this was the right time, there is someone alive today and in every generation that would qualify to be Mashiach. Mashiach is not a hope for the future. He exists in every single generation. He's a person from the, among the descendants of Judah who is worthy of being Mashiach. As the Chassam Soifer, the a great 19th century scholar, uh, has written that from the time of the destruction of the Holy Temple, there was born a person, a righteous person, worthy of being Mashiach if the time was right. If there were no impediments for his actually coming, he would have come already. So, in other words, there is a person already prepared in every generation, just the timing, something about the timing is preventing him from coming. This character, this, this person, uh, is considered like the Moses of a generation. He personified personify uh, what Moses' role was. Another thing, being that Mashiach is a part of, is a job description. Um, one thing that you'll notice that we didn't say was that Mashiach's coming or the person of Mashiach will be required to do any type of miracles. Uh, take a look at text number eight. One should not presume that the messianic king must work miracles and wonders and bring about new phenomena in the world, resurrect the dead, or perform other similar deeds. This is definitely not true. The main thrust of the matter is this Torah is statutes and its laws are everlasting. We may not add to them nor detract from them. In Judaism, the idea of miracles is a very far secondary idea. It's not intrinsic at all to the requirement, the traits that Mashiach must have. In fact, the, the Torah itself warns in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 13, that a person may come along with a sign and a wonder and something that amazes all the people. And just because he makes a wonder doesn't make him anything particularly special. It says that if what he does encourages people in their worship of God and encourages the observance of the Torah and its commandments, then we are to listen to that individual. However, if the person brings a sign or a wonder or he brings five wonders or many miracles, if what comes out from that is instruction to serve God in a different way or to worship a different God or to abandon any of the commandments or adding to any of the commandments, we know that that person is a false prophet, a test from God, and we were meant to reject him. So let's review all of the things that Mashiach's traits, his qualities that he's meant to have. So he's a human being, born of King David, born of, as a descendant of King David through his son Solomon. He's a very righteous individual. He is a profound Torah scholar and strengthens the Jewish people's observance of the Torah as well. Now, once a person has those qualities, what 
must Mashiach accomplish? Like, again, in every generation, there's someone who fits that criteria. But how will we know when Mashiach, without a shadow of a doubt, has done what he needed to do? So one thing that he will do is restore the monarchy of King David. Now, why would we pray every day that Mashiach come and restore the monarchy of King David? Isn't democracy a more advanced or enlightened form of government? See, in Judaism, a king is very different than the way we might think about it. The Jewish king has to be constantly aware of God's presence and always in awe of him as well. He has total submission to God. In fact, our submission to the king is meant to reflect and aid in our ultimate submission to God. So the king is a tool that the nation has as far as subjecting oneself to his rule. It's meant to be a sort of teaching tool of how we're meant to be submitted to God. The Mashiach, the Messianic King, will draw the best qualities out of each of us and assist us in reaching our highest potential. Mashiach's kingship will not be imposed on the world by force. In Jewish tradition, a king, he doesn't rule unless the people voluntarily choose him, unless they accept upon his kingship. Um, so they'll have to accept the Jewish king, they'll have to accept Mashiach as their leader and accept their, his kingship upon themselves. Accepting Mashiach's kingship implies that we recognize his superior godly qualities and choose through our own volition that to subjugate our will to his will, to Mashiach's rule, it won't feel like an imposition or an interference uh, without our autonomy. On the contrary, the Messianic king will draw the best qualities out of each of us and assist us in our highest, reaching our highest potential. You know, one problem with, with democracy as it's practiced today is that we lack truly inspired leaders. A leader in a democratic government are sometimes more a follower than a leader. Elections are usually divisive, and each candidate attempts to pander to their various interest groups. In contrast, Mashiach is a leader who will expose us to our, a higher dimension of existence and teach us how to transcend our petty self-interest and reach, our, reach a very sublime level of reality. So he'll restore David's kingship. Secondly, and the next three things that we're going to talk about are really the most important things, the biggest signs that Mashiach is here. He will rebuild the temple in its place. The prophet Ezekiel, you'll see on your, on your handout, says, I will form a covenant of peace for them, an everlasting covenant shall be with them, and I will establish them and will multiply them and will place my sanctuary in their midst forever. So Mashiach's coming comes with the building of the temple. And when that temple is built, it will be everlasting. Another quality of Mashiach is that he will gather the dispersed of the Jewish people, all the exiled people from around the world, back to the Holy Land. As it says on your handout once again, the Lord your God will bring you back all your exiles and he will have mercy upon you. He will once again gather you from all of the nation where the Lord your God has dispersed you. Even if your exiles are at the ends of the heaven, the Lord your God will gather you from there and take you from there. So, again, he will rebuild the temple and it will be an everlasting temple and he will ingather the exiles. The last big quality, big accomplishment of Mashiach is establishing a lasting world of peace a peace that becomes an eternal reality devoid of all evil. Like it says in Isaiah, a nation shall not lift up sword against another nation, neither shall man learn war anymore. So the three big qualities, let's review them again, are building the temple, an everlasting temple. Secondly, being uh, someone who gathers in all of the exiles from around the world. And lastly, ushering in an era of world peace that lasts forever. One question that many people ask rabbis or have on Judaism in general is why Judaism has not embraced people from history who have claimed to be Messiah or people have thought of them to be Messiah. 
perhaps the most evident person that has come from the Jewish people has been the founder of Christianity. People ask, why doesn't the Jewish community accept this person as their Messiah, as Mashiach himself? So without getting too much into chapter and verse, and this is not the forum for that, one thing, the biggest things that we can mention are that he did not fulfill these three big prophecies, these three big accomplishments that Mashiach is meant to fulfill. He did not rebuild the temple, an everlasting temple. He did not ingather the exiles, and he did not establish a eternal world peace. In fact, very much the contrary. After he was executed, the Jewish people were dispersed throughout the world after the temple was destroyed, and perhaps there's no other person in history who has had more bloodshed in their name than that individual. Now, we're not saying that that was his original intent, that he wanted bloodshed, or that was a good thing that came from him, but nonetheless, the reality is that none of the three big accomplishments, the main accomplishments that Mashiach is meant to do, came about through this individual. And that's why Jewish people historically, currently, and in the future, will not accept this individual as Mashiach. Nonetheless, there is a very positive quality that came out of the founding of Christianity and later Islam. The Rambam says, the famed medieval sage Maimonides concludes his Mishnah Torah with the idea that Christianity was planted in the world, was brought to the world as a stepping stone towards the real Mashiach, towards the real messianic era. In other words, the world before Christianity was a world of pagan, a world of barbarism, where the worst practices that planet Earth has ever known were taking place on a regular basis. What Christianity did for the non-Jewish nation was brought some key concepts in Torah, the idea of one God, of reward and punishment, of sin and atonement, of Mashiach himself. These concepts got spread to the farthest corners of the earth, where people all over the place would have a, a, at least a general concept of what Mashiach will bring. So that when the real Mashiach comes, it won't be such a, a jump in ideology. Rabbi Yaakov Emden, a 16th century sage, also speaks the praise of what Christianity brought to the nations of the world. He says that it removed the idols from the nations and obligated them in the seven commandments of Noah that they shouldn't behave like animals of the field and instilled within them a basic moral compass. The idea is that even the rest of the world is starting to realize that we're in this together. We are unequivocal partners in articulating the essential moral values and their survival and welfare of humanity. And slowly but surely, we are all reaching the day, as the prophet says, I will transform the peoples to a purer language that they will all call upon God and serve him with one purpose. May that day come very soon. Thank you.